Cool. Hi, listeners of Blue Smooth Radio, and um, you believe it or not, but we are now semi-live. We are live on Facebook now for an interview with Nick Moss and Dennis Grunling, and this is also going to be recorded for a normal Blue Smooth show, where we, tonight we have some recordings of the Nick Moss band featuring Dennis Grunling. Welcome to Blue Smooth Radio, guys. Well, thank, thank you. you. Well, it's a pleasure with all those. We know we, we, it took us a couple of years, but... Uh, uh, Stuart from uh, your management to, to get to us at the date and finally we worked it out so we're very stoked to have you for our cameras and our uh, microphones and first of all how's the tour going on now for you? Uh, well first of all you're very honored to have us and uh, <laughs> it's been going great <laughs> been having a great time had a lovely few days off just recently to recharge the old batteries yep well, we'll see if that works for you tonight. <laughs> we'll find out. Well, first of all, we're going to put a little wager in for you guys. We heard that you were saying that the German people were a better audience than the Dutch. Um, that is not true. <laughs> that is absolutely not true. Hans was saying that. Hans told us <laughs> that the German audience is the best audience there ever was. And Hans is from the Netherlands, so... If there's anybody that is upset by this, Hans will be at our show tonight. And for the rest of them, they feel free to come up and talk to him. I think that's a good idea because we want to set that record straight tonight. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. I will say this. The people of Netherlands, your toilet paper is much better. <laughs> what, what, which one you had? The gray uh, single ones of the four layers with the flowers? Well, I'm going to say that uh, I don't know what you're using over here, but it's soft and comfortable. <laughs> the flower. I think makes me have... feel clean. And uh, I just, it's all around. It's a better toilet paper. It's a in, better, ver you know. Yeah, in the end, it's just a better toilet paper. In the end. Is it on the end. <laughs> on the Is end. it important, Nick, for a blues musician to be clean on stage? Yeah. Absolutely. No buts no, about it. For the drummer, at least. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes. I always want to be clean and f have that, you know, sometimes when you're on stage and you have that not so fresh feeling, it can throw the whole tempo, the whole, uh, uh, the when the show is disrupted because you don't feel clean, it affects everything. And how do you resolve, resolve that? Well, you know, it's <laughs> always, it's always nice when you're provided a, defeat. a soft, yeah. You know, toilet bathroom, paper, bathroom tissue, bathroom tissue. <laughs> that's a, that's a more appropriate term, I think. I mean, we're bathroom on the radio, tissue, yeah. bathroom tissue. Yeah. yeah, and it's not always for what most people use it for. I like to use it for everything. Cooking, cooking, hmm. cocaine. Yeah. No, <laughs> is that what I? <laughs> <laughs> cooking, cooking. Sorry, it sounded very similar. <laughs> Come on. What, what? <laughs> just, just because we're musicians, you have to go there. <laughs> well, I think if uh, a musician started by toilet paper, the subjects are all in. <laughs> I think there's nothing accepted for that. Well, I think if anyone was going to use cocaine and have a nosebleed, it would be nice to have a soft toilet paper. Or bathroom tissue. Or bathroom tissue. If you to be able to blot up that, you know, yeah, sometimes when you, you know, you already have a nosebleed. Oh, I am. And then you got to use rough bathroom tissue. It makes it worse. I take an expert opinion about yeah. that every day. Thank yeah, you for your that much, very much. It's an awful thing. Yes. How's your cooperation came across? Why, why is Dennis Grundling on this tour with you? I can't imagine why, but for our listeners, but yeah, I wanted to find out this reason too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How is what? Why do you took uh, Dennis on tour? <laughs> yeah, fuck if I know. <laughs> oh. He's still uh. figuring that one out. <laughs> yeah. Well, comic relief <laughs> is one. No, why wouldn't I take that as Grinling? <laughs> He's one of the world's finest harmonica players. I'm absolutely. Yeah, but how came it? He's uh, absolutely the best dressed harmonica player on the planet. Well, thank you. I've seen a Ford of Vegetarian. He wears a lot of dead animals. I've seen. <laughs> Oh, I've, seen not, I've seen everything down to his underwear, and it's, <laughs> he goes all out. Yeah, so. <clears throat> Hello. Well, at least you've seen him in underwear. That's, That's right. true. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I don't know what his voice is. Hey, you know, is. when you're on the road, you get close, closer than you want to be. It's a, it's a harsh reality 
maybe the men and women out there in Blue Moose Land uh, don't understand what it takes to be on the road for, you know, two, three, four, five, six weeks at a time with four other guys. Uh, the sights, the sounds, the smells I, well, that occur. I, I, well, that was funny for first question. Yes. I guess you have a no fart rule in the bus. No, absolutely not. <laughs> when you gotta go, you gotta go. Why would you? Why would you say that? When you gotta, <laughs> when you gotta go, you gotta go. <laughs> the only thing that I have two because rules it, about it that ruins the atmosphere. Touring. Well, no, there's 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 a couple of rules. Okay, if you're going to do it, warn, let someone know it's coming so you can roll the window down. If you if you let it go. <laughs> And don't say anything, and just keep it to yourself. And then that Undercover, flo- yeah. floats around the, uh, the van. You're just an asshole. Okay, roll the window. Give a warning. Hey, fellas, it's coming. Yep. Simple, real yep. easy. Or a pre Hey, you know? everyone's got to <laughs> do it. Yeah. Every- everyone's got to do it. Or here's another one. Clamp down on that seat and trap it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> just like a sandwich yeah if you, if you can clamp down on that seat and trap it down in there and you're confident enough that you can do it then do it okay bury it it's not hard to do don't lift right. up a cheek <laughs> that's that's wrong okay but if you're you know what i'm saying if there's no other ways around it just let everyone know we just crack a window it escapes it's during it's the hot part of the tour the driving the physical get a, getting around yes yeah yes yeah. the touring is the hardest part i know we're, I know. we're so we always say um, that's a, a, a verbatim from joe louis walking he said i'm a professional traveler and in between i play music that's true yeah that's yeah. true There's a lot of traveling more more time traveling than playing really but nevertheless but, but, uh, i think uh, europe is pretty lax to travel in the distance are, are closer by than uh, that's true that's true <laughs> can't trust this guy with anything <laughs> no i think we're gonna <laughs> get, real good, get, get along <laughs> he's not ready with us yet that's right how do you how do you co- i'm gonna show you what dennis does hey let's see what's happening here yeah but the, the, somebody has to be talking in order to do that do you oh, see what okay. i'm saying now in order to really make it effective you have to <laughs> synchronize it with the other person's voice. <laughs> oh, wait. One second. No, wait. Two seconds. Wait. All right. Back to Dennis. <laughs> I've seen... Uh, it, it looks looks like a bit the dressed-up version of Ahmed, the the dead terrorist. <laughs> He's doing yes. a puppet. The puppet here. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's the ventriloquist. Yeah. Now, about the music, guys, um, yes. you're going to play some songs. Is it Nick Moss songs or Dan and Grunzel songs or a mix up of both? We do a little bit of both, and then we do a lot of, you know, uh, uh, classic, just, you know, old school blues. Yeah. How much improv- uh, improvisation is allowed on stage by you guys? I, I'm, for the guests, a lot. Oh, yeah. Uh, in, in you seize the moment. In, in terms of what? For like solos? Solos or. <laughs> Uh, well, stretching a song well, yeah we do a lot of that i will say this and i'm just this is just my own personal philosophy if you're playing this kind of music and you're not improvising you're really selling the music and the audience short i mean you can't it's just it's to me there has to be a good portion of that that's part of the magic and the beauty of this kind of music is how you express yourself you know and with your vocal phrasing with your soloing you know, I mean, even when you're doing a cover tune, I mean, you can do it in the style of somebody and still improvise and express yourself. Isn't that. it also a moment of um, creativity that you come up with something new of or, or something? Hey, I played yesterday, something like that. That's that's a new song, basically. Or can you use it for a new song? Or is it strict sure. within the parameters of the blue song you started and hopefully everybody ends at the same time? Well... We or usually que- for endings. I mean, endings are usually <laughs> cued. I mean, wouldn't you say so, Nick? <laughs> and who gives the cues, Nick? Whoever's whoever's song it is, whoever's playing this or singing the song, you know. Yeah, most of the time it'll be Nick, but you know, just if I'm leading the song or singing something, I'll I'll cue because you know I'll, I'll okay. be doing that. 
Um, about blues, um, Nick, congratulations. You're a uh, multi awarded blues artist, at least by the Blues uh, multi Foundation. Multi nominated. Nominated. <laughs> Never won. Now, now you, you've won an award now. I did win an award this past couple of weeks here. I won the. Uh, Award in Or Germany, the European Blues the, Award. The, yeah, in Germany for the International Artist of the Year. <laughs> well, Ed. in Germany. It, yeah. must, it must be a little bit of a award of uh, all the years you put in. And I like how you're laughing about it. Cheapens it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I Thanks, Rob. I wouldn't say it right in your face, but <laughs> Thank you, buddy. it is a sort of a funny uh, award. But I, I can tell you a lot about that later. Oh, okay. But I'm, I'm talking about which I think more highly, uh, highly fun- awarded than the Blues they, Music Awards. Aren't they all funny awards? In a certain aren't way, Aren't they all cheap awards? I don't Even know if they're the all cheap. Even the Blues Music Awards? They're not cheap. There's a, I, there's a difference in cheapness in that one. There absolutely is. Well, I can talk to you more about that later. I, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> what does it bring you something? Of course it does. It, it has to. Yeah. Sure. I got a nice certificate and a frame. They brought me that. Yep. So you, you have got to. some more views on Facebook. I did the live thing. Yeah. No, you have to I mean, watch, watch I mean, look, your suitcase. Look, here's what I'm going to say about any award, whether it's the Blues Music Award, whether it's the, that award I got in Germany for international artists, whatever, whether there's a thing called the Blues Blast Awards that now happen in oh, the yeah. United States. And that's kind of taken off, too. <clears throat> As someone who has been doing this for over 25 years now, 27 years, almost 28 years now. Yes, it is nice to be recognized for your work. Yes, it is nice to be recognized for all the hard work that you put in. It's awesome to be recognized because we bust our ass year in and year out to get here. And if someone wants to recognize you, whether it's a made-up award or whether it's sanctioned by some big group, even those things, the big ones, you know, like that, there's a certain amount of what the hell is going on there, okay? You don't ultimately know what, what you know, first of all, any award for an art to me is weird, I don't think that you should be... No, it's not a competition. It's not yeah. set up as a competition. Yeah. Right. I don't think it should be. You know, art is not a competition. It's nice to be recognized, um, but all these things are incomplete. You know, there are rules on how you go about even getting nominated. You have to turn in your thing at a certain amount of time to even be considered to be nominated. Okay. So there are people out there maybe don't have, can't afford, don't have the wherewithal to get their stuff, you know, to these people to be nominated. There are people that maybe, you know, out there playing, don't have blue societies behind them, backing them. There's all all kinds of stuff involved, okay? But all that beyond, you know, that that awards for this kind of stuff, to me, is a little absurd, Would I like to win one? Fuck yeah. I would love to win one. <laughs> yeah, it's great because you're getting recognized. It's nice to be recognized. I'm not going to lie. And uh, I've been nominated 19 times for the Blues Music Awards. Haven't won one yet. But I've been in categories with some of the greatest names in blues. It nominated in, in certain categories with with guys like, you know, B.B. King and... and <laughs> And Magic Slim and John Primer and and Kim Wilson and Ronnie Earl and all these guys. I and and just this year we were up there with Derek Trucks and his, and, his, and his lovely wife and they won the award. Of course they won the award, but I was one of five in that category. Yeah, it's kind of cool, you know. But how much more has it gotten me? It's gotten me some recognition, but I will tell you this. I work my ass off. I have no record label behind me. I've done this all on my own. Completely on my own. And I say that knowing that my wife is listening because I <laughs> mean to say that we've done it all on our own. Because my wife, Kate, since the get-go, has been there and my number one backer. She's the one 
behind the scenes and everyone knows this back home she's well known you know plus she plays too so she gets up but since the get-go we've been doing this all on our own own record label recording our own records paying for everything paying for our ads pay, you know getting distribution finding distribution so that you over here in the netherlands know who i am so that the people in germany know who i am you know well, maybe I, we've done everything on our own Maybe, maybe it's the wise thing to do to cut out the middleman. And nowadays, you know, with, with, it, with the internet but and there, the, the technology. There, yeah, there's that. But there's also the fact that, like, when you got when you have a record label pushing your stuff, there's so much less pressure. You know, yeah. and there's a you know. Okay, I understand. You, there's things that you know behind the scenes. Besides, just, you know, people say, "Oh, you're out on the road playing." You don't know what it's like f to get from point from my house to the stage. Everything that happens in between, to get from my front door to this stage, everything that happens in between, and we're doing it all on our own. If I had to write it all down and you had to read it all, you'd say, "Shit, I wouldn't want to do that job. I'd rather go work at a bank or be a plumber." <laughs> they get paid better, shorter hours, and they get to be home with their families. And more at job, the end of the day and better job security probably exactly mm. and dennis he's the same way i met dennis over 20 years ago doing the same thing the whole time he's been doing it you know i make fun of dennis a lot of time but it's because <laughs> we're friends that he's always on his phone and taking sel selfies of himself <laughs> on instagram he's always doing stuff like this <laughs> but this is what it takes self-promotion this is exactly what it takes self-promotion you know because no one else is going to do it for you no one else is going to step up and do it right. you got to do it you got to do it yourself you got to put in the work i have people always telling me constantly like Oh, you know, like, I don't get callbacks, or I don't get this, well, get it, it's like the Nike symbol, and I don't mean to push them, but they got that thing, just do it, just do it, if you don't do it, no one's going to do it for you. Yep. yep, I think that's, uh, and so like, going back to the thing, all those awards and stuff, you know what? It's a. I did that. I got myself. It's a recognition there. for yourself. Yeah, yeah I, I did that. My wife and I did that. We got ourselves there. They didn't do that for us. We did it. It was nice that they recognized that we did that much to get there. But ultimately, I'm taking the credit for that. And you don't see me a guy who wants to be too much involved in all the politics that's around that. So I don't. I, <laughs> that's all know, for that. I don't. You know, exact. You know, like I said. Would I like to be? Would I like to win one time? Yeah, I think it would be great to win one time. This year we uh, marked my nineteenth nomination, and we were we were nominated for uh, three. We had three nominations. One was for album of the year. One was for uh, contemporary album of the year, and one was for band of the year. Out of those three, the only one I cared about, and it wasn't for me. It was band of the year, and it was for the guys that worked behind me and next to me. And, out, and side by side every night. I wanted those guys to win. These are the guys that bust their ass for less pay than I get because I gotta pay, you know pay these guys. I know what they're getting, and they and these guys do this night after night yeah. for the passion and the love of music and being able to play and being on stage and working their butts off, doing their homework mm -hmm. and studying. And I know just how. How hard they work! I wanted those guys to win that award, not for me. I wanted I wanted Band of the Year, so I could go see guys. This is you guys earned everything on this. Now you paved the way for the next question. Um, those guys that working with you, um, what are the what are the first qualities to have to to back you up as a band? The the drum and the bass, the backline. The first thing that I look for is someone that has just a love of playing they're not out there because they think it looks cool on stage <laughs> they're not out there because they think oh man this is just an easier way to make a living i've played with guys like that i play with guys that just want to be up there because they look cool on stage i play with guys that have been up there because you know <laughs> i don't have to get up at you know nine to five every day and go get a job you're not out there because you know you're chasing skirt or looking for your next fix 
Uh, they told, you know, always tell me that they, for the skirt, you have to play the guitar. Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Look at me. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah. I mean, the first thing I look for is, like I said, is the love of music. Is that, man, I want to know what your passion is and why you play, why you play the instrument. Why did you get into music? The next thing is, can you be taught? You don't have to know what blues is. Can you be taught? And that comes from, like, when I listen to someone play, I'm like, do they have a good feel? Do they have good timing? You know, there are, there are guys, there are musicians out there that are wonderful musicians that, you know, can play with a metronome and can read sight music, but their feel is gone. They have no feel. They, unless they're playing to a metronome, they can't, they're, they don't know how to put the, put it's hard to explain on a, on a microphone, but you got this little camera. What I'm saying is, can you put your heart... Oh, you say shut up for your, uh, some other reason, oh. so you don't bother that. Camera. Oh, anyways, but <laughs> can, can, you, can you translate what's inside of you, your heart and your emotion, can you translate that to your fingertips or to your vocal cords? Isn't that the most important thing in blues, the that's, feel? Well, that's what I play. I play blues. So, yeah. yes, it's the most important thing, and that's what I look for. And and you know, other than that, I don't need anything else. If you can, if you've got those things, the rest I I can teach you. Can I add something yeah. to that? I mean, you know, I, I've known you for many years, but I've only been touring with the band for a short time. But uh, I, my experience with the band, and and the little bit before, and of course working with you on you know on occasion all these years, and now m mostly full time, is it's also. Everybody seems to be a team player, which is such an important thing in anything artistic, yeah. let alone something so personal where your your emotions are involved and you're expressing yourself and you need to be working at your best without any other kind of, you know, things getting in your way mentally or worrying yeah. about, oh, am I going to step on this guy? Is this guy going to be upset about this? Or am I going to, you know, that's such a, a big part to me of working in a band and making it really work i can remember you know? a discussion or that's an true. interview we had with, with jason ritchie and that was a, a buddy of yours and uh, i love jason uh, when, I, when he was playing with um get better buddy he's sick yeah, he's, oh he's, that's he's right awesome. yeah, yeah. Feel better, man. he was playing with um and I'm, i forgot his name in his band uh, who also has a solo band and they say we can switch roles if i'm playing as him's band he's the boss John and if they're playing yeah John Lisi, yeah, and he was playing. Him, and he was playing. Player. Him, I'm the boss, mm -hmm. and that's strict. He said, but yeah. we can change roles depending depending on which band you're playing, and that's yeah. what I listen to. This um, short thing about blues um, is it allowed. To, I, I I just came across an, an uh, odd discussion in uh, my view, and that's a European view. Maybe in America it's much more uh, black and white, and that is, can white people play blues? This is uh, <laughs> this is heavily discussed amongst most musicians. I, I've I've, yeah. I've heard the conversation many times. I've seen a bunch of posts on Facebook by yeah, some me too, people. and I was a little bit surprised with it. That that's they they that's get a, a whole lot of history with it. We didn't understand. We thought it's a great music source and whatever you here's 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 here's, here's 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 what I I understand from. And I'm not going to claim to say that this is the th this is uh, that I'm even right in, in understanding this, but from the side of the African American, they're saying that ultimately it was their music they started it, and it came from and you know slavery and it came from the oppression yep. of being a slave, and that's where the music came from. And I get that it's their music and. Um, to be able to sing blues to to a big degree for me, I'm not sure that there is a white person that can sing blues um, any better than than an African American, and I'm not sure there there's there's been too many white people that would be able to uh translate that that feeling of oppression of being you know from 
you know, the African American community and all the years of oppression that they've had, how the, how do you translate that in your vocal, the pain, the hurt and all that stuff like that? Yeah. I completely agree with that. The one thing that I will say is that was a lot of the blues that was recorded then you know them uh, releasing this 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 anger and hurt and emotion i don't know how much blues since the 1920s or whatever 30s or 40s is even about that anymore most of it is about a relationship between a man and a woman yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. most of the stuff was most of it is about you know yeah. uh the the pain and anguish you go through on a daily basis i don't know how much of it is still about working you in know a- working on, on 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 a plantation and so in that regard i don't see the difference between being able to sing about a man i know what it's like to be hurt by a woman i know what it's like to be to work my ass off and not get paid you know then you know there's also i can say that and then there's going to be people that say oh yeah but you know a black man gets paid you know less than you do well in the blues world that's not true <laughs> because i know what i get paid and i know a lot of guys we all get paid the same and it's shit and some guys get paid on a shittier higher scale than we, than we do <laughs> but it's still shit compared to what people make so i'm just talking about for myself uh, do I acknowledge that it, that it's an African American music? Yes, it is, and I, for one, I love it. I respect it. I revere it. Um, you know, I respect and revere all the guys that came before me, and I pay my respects every night on stage by playing this music. And I don't claim it to be my music, um, but as far as playing it, um and 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 playing with emotion i'm gonna say one thing jimmy rogers told me this if you've never cried on stage while playing this music then you've never played the blues and i'm gonna tell you something i can honestly say i fuck i fucking played where there's been times when i've had tears streaming down my face not because it's so good of what i'm playing but because i'm releasing some kind of emotion that was pent up in me something happened and it triggered something and i'm letting this audience i'm letting my band i'm letting the world i'm letting the universe in on something that's very fucking personal sure when i play my music and that's what this music is about it's about feeling it's not a black and a white thing you know the only thing like i said yeah man it's an african-american art form and i thank god that they started it I really do, you know, but as far as can can black people play or white people play a black music, I think they can. I I, I feel they can. There may be others really? that say no, Run but I feel they can. As far as singing it, I feel there's a, been a lot of really great white vocalists that sing their ass off, you know, and sing with emotion. Um, but as far as singing the pain and the anguish of the black plight, no. But they're singing their own pain and emotion. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm very glad for this answer because, as I said, we're European. We're somewhat far away about that history and well, the the whole um, discrimination, black and white thing. That's somewhat further away from us. But than that's, this, an, but that's, 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 a, that's a, exactly. yeah, that's a whole that's a whole other discussion. And they they they, 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 they fetch it. Any way they can in, into that discussion, and um, sure. maybe it's also to do with my opinion about any art form, if it, it's blues, jazz, or painting. Well, I if you don't that. learn from the people who did it before you and take that to another level, then it, it's a dying art form, and blues is absolutely not well, a dying art form. No, I think there's some people that have been out there that... Uh, th- We hate that, the discussion, l- keeping the blues alive. Uh, yeah, I think there's been a discussion... Necessary. I think there's been a discussion on our end, and at least in the U.S., as far as I've read about, about that. And that's due to some of these acts that are out there that are that lean more to the rock side than the traditional blues side. And... In that regards, uh, in that regard, um, 
and this is coming from someone that has gone over that line and play you know I, I i've done at least four cds that i wouldn't consider our blues albums they're blues based uh you know mm. they're blues yeah. influenced but i wouldn't call them blues albums and, and i put them out but i think ultimately what some people have a problem with is the fact that a lot of these acts are being labeled as blues being put on blues fest being able to get shows in blues clubs and meanwhile there's other artists that are strictly blues artists right yeah and right. are good I, I and aren't getting these slots and getting these uh festivals and getting these shows yeah you know but unfortunately the bulk of your blues audience is i'm gonna i i'm this is conservative i'm gonna say is 70 yeah. percent white mm-hmm. and it's probably more, more probably is 70 percent white and it's not only that it's probably 80 percent you know your age range is 40 to 65 or 40 to 70 year old oh uh, people w- sure. we can who, see that who, on the internet yeah who, who grew up in an era with eric clapton yep. and yep. jimmy hendrix Absolutely and true. jeff beck and led zeppelin and the rolling stones sure. so they don't they don't uh put themselves in that mindset of blues is is muddy waters yep. and holland wolf they, they go they generation know, back but yep. they all yep. they know is that their favorite bands were influenced by these guys and they so when they see other bands nowadays modern bands that play blues rock or blues like kind of music it's closer to what they grew up with and heard on the radio they're more inclined to go see that than go see yeah. you know someone playing some lowdown but I, but real real blues when i right. started out i thought sweet home chicago was by the blues brothers <laughs> well <laughs> see, there you, go. <laughs> you know and then you learn something <laughs> you know De- dennis is, dennis had a radio show for 15 years over 15 years and he's played everything you know i don't know how far back your the the records go as far as like as age oh. as it, they went back but all the way up to modern style blues man and so like anyone that would could probably give you some insight on that too would be him also man because the way he you know no, the, the records that he plays prior to this interview where i asked him I, I saw him doing this last show and he does the live stream on facebook and i said one thing that um was 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 catching me is that you sing all the songs and I'm plays. I'm, I'm a DJ. I play blues songs. And I'm <laughs> absolutely don't know all the songs by heart and sing them along with uh-huh. it. And he said, "It's all my own records. I yeah. know them <laughs> before I play them." Yeah. yeah, I like to know what I'm playing, and I like to play what I like. It's of course it's your native language. That's also yeah. an advantage. Sure, the worst words, but nevertheless, I saw sure. you doing it. Well, music really is my native language. I mean, that's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still working on my English. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah the music i mean you know you've you've seen my, and heard yeah. my radio show and some people would like to consider me a traditional artist you know i i feel like um i like all kinds of music i consider myself a, a blues artist but not necessarily traditional i mean blues has always expanded and have gro- yeah, has I grown i see it as a tree with a lot of branches sure yeah. sure however there's you know kind of going on a little bit of what Nick said there's there's always been music that's been blues influenced but people wouldn't call it blues and it seems like nowadays people want to call anything even that's been influenced by blues blues and it's kind of a discredit to a lot of bands who really do play there's got to be some kind of boundaries or parameters or else there's no definition to what any genre is you know, and I feel like yeah, I agree to that. There's been so many, so many rock bands over the years that are influenced by blues, and I I like that stuff. I mean, I listen to the Cramps and ACDC. I listen yeah. to Bach and Beethoven. All that stuff. You know, I mean, it, it, it's good music. Is I wouldn't discredit that at all. And I grew up listening to rock. That's how I learned about blues. But there's got to be a defining you know border between the genres somehow or else the names mean nothing you um, know how's that comparing to um choosing the harmonica as your favorite instrument to play that kind of music right what do you came up with it is 
that was the cheapest one to get one or the, the, the... <laughs> well it's not certainly not the cheapest anymore no not anymore um, but to start out is always well a good... you know i i played trumpet in grade school i, okay. I remember sitting in a school at a, at a, i will in... see i would not see you in a marching band well no and no, i wouldn't no, i wasn't into that but i remember at a, a recital they had some arts thing you know music and and other uh uh, stuff in grade school and i remember seeing a, a a gentleman play trumpet and i was so moved almost to tears by hearing the guy just play trumpet i was like that's what i want to do and i was very young you know but i knew instantly i wanted to play music and you know that went no i played for a couple of years and uh, all i wanted to do was make it growl i stood in front of the mirror every day and tried to <laughs> Get those growly sounds i didn't even realize how how you know how much i wanted to <laughs> how much i wanted to get that bluesy sound yeah i know all, all kinds of shenanigans going on here. <laughs> and um and i played guitar in high school like you know a good percentage of young men and uh but it just the hand thing wasn't working and i got a harmonica as a gift one year for christmas and the same the exact same day i got my harmonica from this family friend he i gave him an, an album that he asked for as in exchange there's always a catch and it was harp attack <laughs> with james cotton and okay. junior wells and i opened my first harmonica and a few minutes later i heard that first blues record that i really ever heard and that was just changed my life i, I mean did a, i did a lot of interviews a lot of people can ma name that pivotal moment yeah in past when the music Greg catch them. I remember it like it was and yesterday that feeling in my the thing in my head the first thing that went through my head was like where has this been all of my life how come everybody does not listen to this music I I didn't understand it you know and then that was it literally every week I would go and buy records and and then self-taught or uh, yeah self-taught self-taught cool just and yeah. also with you Nick against guitar with somebody who said now uh, little Nicky Moss, I'm going to teach you some <laughs> some interesting stuff on those six well, strings. Well, first of all, um, I grew up in a household where music was um, really part of our life. It was a... Mom and Dad. Mom and Dad had, you know, a great record collection. My mom was a huge lover of soul music, loved soul music, early rock and roll. My dad... My dad was a greaser, you know, in the 50s in <laughs> Chicago, you know. He, he was a tough guy, and he listened to doo-wop bands and and, and and big band music, you know. That's explain the word greaser to me. Uh, a greaser, you know, a leather jacket, oh, ducktail, okay. pompadour, you know, okay, all that kind of stuff. Uh, <clears throat> Mods and rockers yeah. in England, yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, so... You know, I grew up with this this music around the house, and both my parents were, you know, blue collar workers. My dad was a pipe fitter, heating and air conditioning. My mom was a beautician, and so it was my brother and I at home. My older brother Joe, and we did a lot of stuff around the house when when my parents were gone meaning that we were little idiots and we would wreck the house while mom and dad were at work. <laughs> and so on weekends, on Saturday mornings in America, there's cartoons yeah. starting I in the morning, very yeah. early until late in the afternoon. And so on Saturday, Saturday mornings when most American kids were sitting in front of the TV eating their sugary cereals, watching all the cartoons, <laughs> Joe and I had to do our chores and clean the house that we had wrecked all week while mom and dad were at <laughs> work and the only rule was uh no tv while you're working but you could listen to the radio or listen to the stereo okay. and i remember just all the great you know music uh, in chicago we had wls radio am back when am radio was still uh, you know the thing and it was a great there was everything you heard yeah. everything from rock and roll to soul music to funk to classic you know like frank sinatra stuff you know they played it all and i remember my brother first getting into music through my uncle my uncle randy my dad's brother who was a lot younger than my dad and he was almost like an older brother to us and he would buy us these records 
And so my brother would start playing DJ on Saturdays and playing records while we were cleaning. And then it be, kind of came this thing that we would sw- switch off, you know, each week. I hope you get pictures us, from that. I wish we did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, you know, we get to play, you know, DJ, you know, like while we're cleaning, like meaning that you got to pick the music that week. Yeah. And you can yeah, change yeah, the radio yeah, station. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And stuff. So, so music was always a big thing. And, and my parents weren't musicians, but I think they recognized that early in for Christmas one year, Father Christmas brought us. <laughs> Father Christmas brought us some guitars. Santa Claus. <laughs> Santa Claus brought us some some Sh- guitars Shinta for Christmas. Claus, yeah. Santa Claus. Good night, Mike. <laughs> and what's that guy? Black. Uh, Black Pete. Black Pete. <laughs> yeah. He smashed mine up. No. Um. Uh, Santa Claus bought us these like you know, uh, uh, classical style guitars. Now my guitar within weeks ended up in pieces under the bed. Oh man. Yeah, it was like that. And my brother's guitar became like part of him. For some whatever reason my brother was a natural. Like he took to it. My dad told him, you know, if you get good enough on this, I'll buy you an electric. With like in months he was already at you know so playing was, an electric guitar. Wow. So sort of there's some know. brotherly competition going on. Well, yeah. no, not not at that point. It was just, you know, I, I I just couldn't focus, you know. Um, and so Joe had gotten so good. Like, I remember his, his music teacher, uh, this guy that used to come over, Jerry. Jerry would Jerry would sit in his car and get stoned before he would come in. We'd look out the window and you'd see him sitting in his old Chevy and the whole thing would be filled with smoke on the inside. <laughs> he'd, he'd get out of the door and you'd see like all the smoke. Like a bad smoke. Cheech and Chung movie. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry was an old hippie, man. And he'd come in and, you know, after like not even a year of teaching my brother, he told my dad, he goes, I can't teach him anymore. He, he already knows. He's already gone through you know, five books of the Mel Bay instructional wow. series faster than, than I could teach him. So <laughs> my brother was that good and he got good. And so just watching him through the years, he started playing with, you know, some friends. They started playing backyard parties and garages and basements and stuff. And I was like, Oh, I want to do that. So when he wasn't around, I would go in his room and sneak playing his electric guitar, <laughs> but I'd always knock it out of tune, and he would always know that that I was in there playing it, so he would always like, man, leave my damn guitar alone. And one of the things I could tell you about my brother is, like, we were always pretty close, really tight, and uh, still are. You know, we weren't the typical brothers that were like, get out of my face. We were always pretty close, but the one thing my brother had was that guitar, that, he, and that was his. <laughs> and so he would get mad. So one day, after this is a few years later, uh, <laughs> after after have going through a succession, I I tried trumpet in school. Yeah. I tried to play drums, but my dad brought home a snare drum, and it wasn't a whole drum kit, so I wasn't interested because it was just one, what am I going to do with this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It didn't really make you crack a fat. No, really. so did, I didn't crack a fat on that one. But It's uh, not, not real Keith Moon on that one. No, <laughs> but I think more more or less it was just not being, you know, I've, I w- I've always been this way uh, until to a certain point where it just hard for me to focus on things. So one day my brother came home with his friend Tom Costanzo, and they had been to a garage sale and I was sitting on the couch and my brother throws this big case on my lap and I was like, what's this? And I must've been about nine or 10 years. No, nah, maybe 11, 11 years old. And he, and he said, it's a bass. If you want to play, learn to play that and leave my guitar home. Alone. <laughs> and I opened it up and it was this old Dan Electro bass and I still have it to this day. And they bought, that bass and an old silver tone amp and they got it for like seven bucks at a garage sale nice. for the whole set and i was like well if i learn to play this do i get to play with you guys and they're like well if you get good enough you can play with us so and the moss brought us yeah and it was like you know i get to, first of all i get to play with the hang around the older guys because they're always <laughs> kicking me out of their rehearsal in the basement and then i get to hang with the older girls that all the chicks that wanted to come see them play i get to all right (laughs) so i started learning how to play bass man and i was like i can do this i love it i love the way it felt i love the way it sounded i love the feel of bass the timing of bass 
it took me a little while. My brother, you know, had to teach me some things, you know, about timing and stuff. And then, um, you know, from then, from there on, I just stuck to it and bass became my instrument. And I still consider myself a better bass player than a guitar player. And I, I love bass. It's one of my favorite things. I played electric okay. bass for many years. I played upright bass, you know, upright bass. I played bass for Jimmy Dawkins. Uh, in the legendary blues band, the first record I recorded, um, which was, I think, Money Talks on the Ichiban label. I'm playing bass on that. Mm -hmm. um, but I switched to guitar full time. I'd always had my, you know, eye on being a guitar player, even while playing bass. And I switched over to guitar uh, in my m early to mid twenties. You lured in with the two extra strings. Well, what ha what <laughs> happened? What happened was, um, what happened was the guitar player in the legendary blues band at the time was a, a f fellow named Willie Greason, uh, and he went by the name Willie Phillips. His middle name was Philip, so he went by his name Willie Phillips at the time. But Willie was uh, was a guitar player, a great guitar player. Is uh, probably one of my besides my brother one of my other bigger influence was willie uh and he was my roommate on the road when i when i was with legendary blues band and we would sit and i'd say willie what did you tonight man when we were playing that song what were you playing and he would sit there and show me and hand me his guitar and i'd play it and eventually it it turned into one of these things like every now, uh, now and then on stage we would just switch up he would play bass and i got to okay. play guitar well willie had some family issues and he had to leave the band and so uh big eyes willie smith said well why don't you just play guitar and we'll hire a bass player since you can teach the bass player easy and so then i became a guitar player well it's full time and then you know i moved on from there to jimmy rogers band and from Jimmy Rogers band you know started this thing and this has been going on since I was a kid and you know you had your it moment yep. on that harmonica album and stuff sure I can't I can't claim an it moment other than I, I had two specific experiences of knowing that this is what I should be doing the first one was as a kid before even playing an instrument and this 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 goes back to not just playing and this is just my mother's record collection my mother uh, uh, you know she would play her records around the house you know when she was cooking and stuff and i remember specifically bb king uh indian Ola, mississippi seeds hmm. she had that album and i used to stare at that album because it was a watermelon cut in half with a guitar neck stuck in it and pickups and it was all strung up like a guitar I was like, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen, you know? <laughs> and uh, I remember her playing that record. And, you know, all the music that we listened to, I loved it. As a kid, I'd run around the house and dance and sing along. But I remember she played that record. And I was, like, tearing through the house at, at so you know, whatever I was doing. And B.B. King played some line on his guitar. And it stopped me dead in my tracks because... I didn't hear it. I didn't hear the guitar line. I felt it. There was this electrical buzz that went through my body, like from the tips of my toes all the way to the top of my head. Like, like it was as real as uh, as Dennis clamping down on my hand with his teeth if he did it right now. I was that. <laughs> it was that physical. I was like, yeah, this buzz, like just from this tone and, and phrasing or whatever he was doing was like, what the hell was that? And I just stood there in front of the speaker, listening to the next four or five songs that were being played on this record and continually feeling like this buzz in my body while I was hearing this. And I was like, well, that's fucking awesome. Whatever that is. And then from that point on, everything I heard in music, if it didn't do that to me physically, it wasn't for me. Hmm. It Nick, was, and, and that's for what somebody who doesn't have a pivotal moment. You yeah. described it as a wonderful pivotal well, moment. That, well, <laughs> you know, I'm just saying I don't remember like you know the 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 record or that made me want to play yeah. guitar. It sure. just made me appreciate music yeah. and realize the power 
of music. Yeah. Oh, that's, and know. then the absolutely brilliant thing is, we we're just talking here, and I'm, I'm, we have already talked our radio show. Oh, <laughs> with all, so I'm gonna be absolutely gonna cut it up in a couple of shows. That's no too problem. too much a lovely talk that we yeah. have to cut it up and sure. We well, always have to play the music, of course. Yeah. That's why we're here. Sure. Um, but I'm not going to end it now because uh, we're still here, and no. that's a little bit jump into the future. And right. That's a bit both of you. You're now Nick Mosband featuring Dennis Gunn. Dennis has yeah. his own band. You're, I've seen you in multiple uh, with the flip tops, but now in Nick Mosband, it's sort of different constellations. Um, but about the, the well, the nearby future in a couple of years, uh, Nick Mosband will still be around. Dennis Grunling will his own band reform or tour? Well, you know, I, I've been, uh, for the past bunch of years, I was touring with another band. I was touring with Doug Deming, who I was on and off the road with for, for, for a long while. And I live in New Jersey, you know, close to Philadelphia, close to New York City. And there's not, honestly, there's not that big of a live music scene for this kind of music. So I Chicago is better. Well, there's other areas of the country, including Chicago, which is better. But, you know, I do a lot of my performing on the road, away from home. And it's been like that for many years because of the, the, the lack of a scene where, where I live, where I'm from. And really, for the, for the most part, I'm doing most of my playing with Nick now. I mean, at home, I have a great friend who I'm very close with, who's a, one of my favorite harmonica players and singers, Steve Geiger, out of the Philadelphia area. That's a familiar name. He's great, and a good friend of mine. Sure. And when I'm home, I perform with him, and I will put together shows when I'm off the road, and you know, we have a... I've, I've known him almost since the first year I started playing, and he's always been supportive and a, and a hero of mine, and we've, we do shows when I'm home together, which is a blast for me. Cool. You know, but I've yeah, I don't have a steady band really at home anymore. I've seen the footage um, on Facebook where you played a couple of days, uh, a couple of days way back, and it's an odd combination if you see on stage. And but then he starts dancing. <laughs> you are starting not to crack up because you had to do a solo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> was that on purpose to get you out out, out of, of your guard? <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> it's fun. Must run along. It's good to be able to do that in, in a <laughs> band and have fun while you're doing it. I mean, I love when I'm playing music. It's it's just about the the most me that I that I can feel the most like myself I can feel for the most part. You know, there are a few exceptions in life, but. Um, to be able to do that with people who you get along with and you can have fun with, uh, you know, it is a great thing. It's a beautiful thing while you're still doing, you know, the your craft the yeah, right way, yeah, you know, with the right people and at ease doing that. Well, there's 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 something to be said about being that free on stage to be that fucking stupid and silly and goofy <laughs> because I learned. I've learned over the years that man, when being too serious on stage is not something particularly for me yeah. that I enjoy. I don't like seeing it on stage. I don't like seeing when bands are that are just too serious. Yeah. I, I oh. love seeing a band that that that, you, that enjoys what they're doing and see what. They, and with that being said, I've been uh, you know. Um, I think you couldn't pick the better spot than Blues Blues well, tonight. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, you know, like. I've had my moments where I've been too serious on stage. I've had my moments, sure. and it, and it, and then I I got to look back at it and be ashamed about it and feel bad about it and stuff. But you know, going back to talking about you know earlier about the guys that play with me on stage and all the hard work that they've put in. I have a young band. They're they're young men. Each one of them could be my son. <laughs> you know, that's how young they are, and training them and. You see and, yourself and as a mentor for those guys. I didn't, but I am. I okay. do not. I do now. I didn't realize that. I didn't. You know, all I know is, I wanted a band to play the music right. These guys have developed into such wonderful musicians and such killer blues artists. You know that they're being noticed by a lot of other people besides myself now, and and I take great pride in that. And being able to play the music without thinking about oh is the piano player going to play this right is the bass player going to play this right is the drummer going to play this right is very freeing to me and it's it's a wonderful thing now and now i have someone in the band that that to be honest is is you know i'm a, i'm already a goofball and and 
I have someone in the band with me that is equal a, a, a goofball <laughs> and possibly even more of a goofball than than I am. Feel free tonight, guys. And uh, <laughs> it's you it's, know it's radio. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, right. you know we we've you know uh, it's it's fun to have that dynamic too. You know one of the one of my favorite things uh, was watching you know Little Charlie and the Nightcats. And they continue that now with Rick and Chris yeah, and Kid like Anderson. Yesterday. Kid, kid's a nut man yeah. on stage. Yeah. I love watching him on stage. Not only listening to him play, he's a killer guitar player, but just watching him. You know, he's a goofball, and him and Rick have this great. You know, and even Charlie and Rick had this stuff. And Charlie, you know, by by all uh, 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 descriptions and accounts, and even Charlie will tell you that Charlie's kind of tight. You know, Charlie's not not as loose as the rest of the guys. Even though Charlie does have a good sense of humor, and he and he knows about you know being on stage and playing playing up that bit. Oh yeah. Uh, I watched those guys for a long time. In fact, you know, talking about pivotal moments, that was another pivotal moment for me. When I was 18 years old, you know, before I, I wanted to be a musician, I thought I was going to go to college and play, you know, American football in college and, you know, aspirations of being a professional football player someday. I had schools looking at me. I, I was a state-ranked wrestler. I could have wrestled in college. But when I was 18 years old, the year that I graduated high school, I lost 80% of my kidneys. It was a genetic thing that no one ever knew about. It just came about one day, and I ended up in a hospital. They told my parents I was going to die. They told my parents, call in a priest. He's got about a 5% chance of living. If he makes it through the night, he's got a 10% chance of living. If he makes it through the week, then we'll talk about his next surgery. Okay. Somehow I ended up... Talking about the blues. Getting through these surgeries, but I ended up having to go to two different hospitals within, with about three months of of major reconstructive surgery on my kidneys and my brother one day shows up at the hospital that i'm at uh which happened to be children's memorial hospital in chicago and they saved my life dr casmer furlett uh that guy saved my life man and he my brother showed up at the hospital and said hey man let's listen to the radio and there's this band coming to town and they're playing right across the street at wise fool's pub now, you've heard of Wise Fools, and maybe some of your blues audience, but it's one of the most famous blues clubs in Chicago, the Wise Fools, and there's been a lot of great recordings there. Otis Rush live at the Wise Fools, uh, Sun Seals. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't even remember. There's probably well, a couple something more. Again. But Wise Fools Pub was right, literally across the street. Like, you go out the front door of the hospital, and well, there it was, right there. And my brother somehow finagled the nurses and the doctors to letting me out that <laughs> night under the guise that we were going to go have just have dinner and uh, bringing somebody with kidney problems in yeah. a pub well and plus i was only 18 and my <laughs> brother brought my brother brought my dad's um ID? camel hair jacket this huh? full-length camel hair jacket because i literally had tubes coming out of the side of my stomach <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> holding my urine in bags because my kidneys were shut down. So I had these two bags with two tubes coming on either side of me. My brother put those bags in a shopping bag, then put this coat on me so that you couldn't see the tubes coming out. Walked me across the street. I guess you don't have a picture of that either. I don't have a picture of that. <laughs> walked, walked me across the street. Told the doorman, whatever he told the doorman, that this kid's only got a month to live. Please let him in. Uh, you know, pleaded, begged and pleaded, you know, on my behalf, you know, have mercy on this young kid. He's going to die. He just wants to see this band. <laughs> whatever it was, he got me in. We sit down. There's five people in the audience, literally five people in the audience. Turns out the band was Little Charlie and the Night Cats. My okay. brother had heard on the radio. WXRT, that this band was coming to town, it was their first recording on Alligator Records. They're playing in town, and it was a little Charlie the Nightcats. I had been in kind of a depression because I had been told, I'm never going to play football again. I can't wrestle. Um, I got to watch myself because of my kidneys. I can never have, you know, a, another catastrophic injury. And my whole being at that time at that age was i was going to be a professional football player mm -hmm. and i was going to wrestle in college and all the stuff and all my friends are going to college all your dreams were shattered at that moment 
Yeah, and uh, I watched these guys play that night, and from the first moment they played, I just was like, this is what I want to do. If I can't go to college, if I can't do this, this is what I want to do. I want to do what they're doing, looking like they're having that much fun, being that incredible of musicianship. I don't care if I don't make millions of dollars. I don't care if, you know, if I don't do if I could do this and be able to pay my bills, that's, this is what I want to do. I remember having that moment right there. I, this is what I'm going to do. And I remember <clears throat> during the break, Rick Estrin comes walking by our table and Rick being, you know, kind of the clothes hound that he is, you know, with all his sharp dressed <laughs> suits, he stopped dead in his tracks and looked at this camel's hair coat, this vintage camel's hair coat that my dad had. And he reaches out and he goes, is that real camel's hair? And he goes to grab it and he's, he's feeling the material. I'm like, yeah, I think so. And he goes, stand up, man. So I stood up. He goes, hey, man, is that is that like Italian silk lined? And he opens the coat to check. <laughs> Like, before I could even do anything, he just opens the coat, and he sees these tubes coming out of me, and he goes, oh, shit, what happened to you? Did you get shot or something? And I was like, you and know. That's I'm, the only opinion in America. And I was trying to, you know, I was trying to oh, trying to explain to him, you know, what, what happened and stuff. And he said, Charlie, come here. You got to see this. And he called Charlie over. He's look at this kid, man. He crawled from the hospital to come see this play. And, uh. And from that moment, right then and there, we kind of became friends, and I and we've been friends ever since. And you know, I told this same story on the Blues Cruise. Uh, Rick and I did a little duo show on the Blues Cruise one afternoon, what kind of impromptu jam, and all these people. I told that story on uh, on the Blues Cruise to all these people, and uh, <clears throat> you know how that changed my life that seeing that yeah. you know that show and this is how how I, I became a musician and everyone clapped and they thought it was a beautiful story and then rick turned to me and said man you can't blame me for ruining your life <laughs> <laughs> let's be honest it started out as a discussion about toilet paper but it became a very very interesting <laughs> conversation about everything yes. you're inspired of, of, of both of you inspired in the blues and in the music and why you're doing what you're doing so um thank you for that and i have to call it quits here because we have to prepare a show we have to sure. get some dinner we have to have some drinks before so we, i'm sure we're gonna talk a lot today um in the venue and afterwards um, and that's luckily for me because i have two people who can absolutely uh, dress up a good story and and tell the interesting stuff about blues and that it's what we like here in blues right. Moves radio well thank you we're gonna record it and thank you for that guys absolutely right. thrilled thank you appreciate it